I can remember going to this place where all these kids were and they didn't have a family. I want to grow up and I want to have lots of kids and I want to adopt many so that I could, we could all be one big family. Every time I would say something like, well, I know I can't do that. God was uh, teaching me that I can't, but he can. And I came home and I started praying. Whatever it is, I want what you want. And our lives turned upside down. It was never again the same. This is what we're supposed to do. We'll, we'll adopt one child with special needs. And then finally, it was like, you know, whomever. You send them, they're ours. All he wants is really our will. I hesitate when people say how many, because he cares about each one as if they were the only God has a purpose for each one of us. Just follow after him hard and love him and tell people about Jesus. Heart is, you know, just a minister to the Larson family. They're obviously in ministry day in and day out. So this is just an opportunity to kind of help hopefully be a little reprieve for them and encourage them. This is this is home for them. My name is Ken Larson, originally from Succasana, New Jersey. We moved here to Interlochen, Florida, 44 years ago. I met my wife when I was 16 and she was 14. A long time ago, we've been married 62 years. And my name is Laverne Beth Larson. And uh, originally we were both born in Brooklyn, but migrated to Succasana, New Jersey, where we met at church. Um, and the story of our, our lives together uh, resulted from all that God had done in the past, even as young as we were. Uh, God uses things in our lives uh, to bring us where he wants us to be. I just look back on our life together and our life individually and how he prepared us for uh, where he eventually wanted us to go. We were both kids and Young people are selfish, you know. They're not. They're not uh, uh, always the giving people that you want them to be. We were very involved in our lives and our romance. And uh, he went into the service at the time there was drafts in the United States, and he boosted his draft. He was by the time he came home after three years. We were married about six, seven months later, and madly in love, innocent in what the Lord was going to do with us. I grew up in a Christian home. I did as well. Um, and I was blessed to uh, go to Christian school where I was uh, fully introduced to Christian living Christian doctrine and the story of Jesus. Uh, I came to understand my need for a savior when I was eight years old with my Christian teacher telling me the story of Joseph. And I thought to myself, I was an only child. I thought to myself, if he was able to forgive those brothers, uh, he, God must have done something really amazing in his life. But I look back on my life personally and I see how one one incident after another 
uh, prepared me for where I was going. Every time I would say something like, uh, well, I know I can't do that. God was uh, teaching me that I can't, but he can. We were married at 18 and 20. 18 and 20. Yeah, your mother had to sign for you. <laughs> In those days, yes. And they offered us either a lot, a building lot, or a wedding. And we said, well, we'll take the, the building lot, and we eloped. Went to Alexandria, Virginia, and we got married. Two days before Thanksgiving and came back to a, an extended family with a surprise of our, our wedding. I had grown up in an environment where we were very involved in church. We had gone to a, a Christian orphanage. I grew up without a father. He never came, he came home from the Second World War, but in those years they didn't understand uh, the effects of war and the marriage ended. So I grew up with a single mom in an extended Christian family. And I can remember going to this place where all these kids were and they didn't have a family. And that was kind of the beginning of how God, I want to grow up and I want to have lots of kids and I want to adopt many so that I could, we could all be one big family. And I had mentioned that to Ken. We were children. Of course, then we didn't think so. And his thought was... Two. <laughs> a boy and a girl. That'd be perfect. Four boys later, <laughs> she was mothering everything she could find. And uh, she heard about foster care. And that sounded good, because that was temporary. We ended up with Pam. She was, and, and that was the thing, too. They asked us, you know, what kind of child we could accept. And I says, a kid is a kid. Is, <coughs> Kid's a kid. What about a handicapped child? I said, there's no such thing as a handicapped child. There's old ladies in wheelchairs, but not children. I had no experience where she had plenty. And uh, they said, okay, we'll keep you in mind. And then we had a, an emergency placement. It was a nine-month little girl, right? And she was severely damaged. She seized almost constantly. Uh, we had her for about nine months, tried to adopt her. We fell in love with her, we fell as did in love our little her. boys. And at that time, if you were a foster parent, you could not adopt a child. It was totally separated. We did have visitation rights, and we would go visit her often. And one visit we got there, and they said, they didn't call you? And I said, no. I said, she expired. What do you mean she expired? She's dead. And that just... It hit us very hard. It changed our lives forever. Yeah. We had applied for uh, adoption, and we were told flatly from many adoption agencies. You had four kids. Uh, right. You have four children. You there, there are other families with no children, and we would place them in those other families before we would place them with you, and that's how we became involved in, in foster care. But God sent Pamela to change our lives. Just a sweet family, honestly, that have made have made mission work a part of their lifestyle for 50 years. Uh, serving, uh, adopted a number of children, you know, in the 30s, I believe, uh, over the course of the years. Uh, all of them pretty much special needs, and just made them their family, made a part of their family, and brought them in. There's certainly, I think, uh, I think there's close to 100 people that have come through the home, and you know, as their they would call them their children, although. The state might call them something else, but um, through different programs and stuff, but just just beautiful, just loving kids, loving on, and many of them are, you know, legally adults now in the in age-wise, but just serving and loving, loving people through their entire lives, and this is, uh, yeah, this is their, their compound, this is their home, beautiful. Um, yeah, just a wonderful, wonderful testimony. We've, I've been able to see and and kind of get to know them and understand what they do uh for probably about 10 years and it's uh, tireless they're in their early 80s now and still doing it so it's beautiful
So at that point, we heard about uh, an agency that uh, placed special needs kids. We applied thinking, I mean, I was compromising. Ken was not. All right, so we won't have 14 children. We'll uh, adopt one child, our fifth and last child. And Mary Beth came to us when she was six months old. She had been in the hospital that length of time. She had been born with spina bifida. She was born in 1973 when prognosis for babies with her special needs was not um, really established. And we were told that perhaps she would live four years, but she had she had had or already at six months old, she had had maybe eight or nine surgeries. And I can remember it was my first plane trip. I was 30 years old. And we ran to catch the plane. It was a commuter plane from Newark, New Jersey to Boston, Levi. Massachusetts. Ken had had a lot of experience flying, but I didn't. So it was really bumpy. He was more concerned. I, we had a truck. It didn't make any difference to me, but we got there. We, you can tell the story about where we stayed. The, uh, Mary Beth was in a hospital school. It was a Catholic hospital school in, in Canton, Massachusetts. They put us in a, in a uh, convent. <laughs> so we were in separate hallways. We met up in the morning, had breakfast. And then we would sit and take care of Mary Beth, or learn how to take care of her. Uh, Mary Beth, like she said, was six months old. She would sit in my lap. Everything was cool, as long as I didn't say anything. As soon as I mentioned the word, she'd turn around and scream, because every male voice she'd heard during her life was a doctor that had heard her. And uh, a female voice was one that comforted her. So as long as I kept my mouth shut, we got along fine. And Mary Beth became my best buddy. She followed me everywhere. Uh, in her wheelchair, um, we were we were very very close, and Laverne sent letters from Mary Beth back to the hospital school in Massachusetts, with telling pictures. Her, yeah, about her life, her new life with her brothers in in uh, New Jersey, and then uh, the social worker called and said, "I hope I didn't get in trouble, but I put your name in. There's another little girl here born with spina bifida." Uh, I think it's a shoe, and you can you can have her. Uh, it was through Catholic charities, and she said, "You're you're Catholic, so it's fine." I said, "No, we're not Catholic. It's not fine." But it it ended up fine. We went up to Massachusetts, and we brought Clarice home. And soon after that, year maybe a year later, Mary Beth was in the hospital having another brain surgery, and the uh, neurosurgeon, you know, gave us a grim report at that point, and said, "Oh." By the way, there's another little girl. The social situation is not too great. I'm sure you can have her if you want her. She's got spina bifida as well. And that was our Amanda. And I will preface this by saying <laughs> every time that God placed these children in our lives right. were times that were yeah. economically not right. Uh, uh, things were falling apart around us. And yet he made it clear. We were terrified. I, you know, I can remember flying home with, with Mary Beth on the plane. You know, what, what have we done? I'm so afraid. And yet, that's when that verse came to us that showed up. your strength is made perfect. strength is made perfect in my weakness. And it's His grace. It's it has you know all any good thing in our lives is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. Anything you see of the dross is us not dead yet, because that's what Jesus said. You know, a seed has to fall into the ground and die before I can do anything with it. The potter's wheel, he gave us so many different explanations in, in, in the New and Old Testament. It isn't until the clay is yielded to the hands of the potter that anything good can come out of it. And all he really wants is your will. That's yeah. all he wants and, is your will. And you know, I wrote, things happen. I wrote how what little things, one by one, we had an amazing life. We had four little boys. 
Uh, his dad had sold us his wonderful Cape Cod house, the picture of, of success in the world. We had a wonderful church. Our kids were all well. And there was a, a woman who came to our Young Adults Fellowship, and she gave her testimony about how God had brought her to salvation. It's long and involved, but the bottom line was she finally yielded to God from a very unusual background, and she shared her testimony how they went through, she was extremely successful, how they went through amazing places in order for God to use her for his glory. And I came home and I started praying. I said, God, I want that life. I want to live there. And I'd been praying about children for a long time. We'd been in and out of agencies. Uh, Pam was, that was when uh, Raymond was two, our youngest. We went through several years of inquiring. And uh, I didn't know it, but Ken had had that same feeling as he left that, that meeting that night. And as we spoke to each other, after all kinds, oh, there were just this idyllic life all of a sudden plum. Our, our healthy fourth child had to go in for emergency surgery at six weeks old. My grandmother became ill. My mother had a heart attack. We had a fire in our bedroom. A rabbit squirrel. <laughs> he wound up bit by a rabbit squirrel. And I'm like, I don't understand what you're doing, Lord, but I trust you. And that particular day, he went in and uh, the, the medium that they... Uh, he was bit by the squirrel, he caught it, and it bit him on a Sunday. And we went to the emergency care, and the doctor there said, uh, just keep that squirrel. It was, and we thought it was somebody's pet, because it's a it was a squirrel. flying squirrel. They're not native to New Jersey. And the next day, the squirrel died. So he said, I, I need to send this in to uh, Trenton to get it tested. And he called me soon after that. I guess it was Wednesday morning. Where's your husband? And they went and found him in New York City at his job. He's got to have rabies shots. The squirrel died of rabies. Well, I was a very fearful person. I, I felt that the only way I could keep things safe was to keep them around me. And he traveled back and forth to the city. And, you know, whether the doctors had never experienced this before, so he went to have the shots. He had a reaction to them. He, they, they told us at that point that if you don't get the shots, you'll probably die of rabies, but you may die of the reaction. So we're not sure what to do. You'll have to go to the hospital, and we'll meet you there tomorrow. Right. And that afternoon, I, I just, I, 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 God, I can't do this. There's no way. But whatever you want, if he's going to die, I was 24 years old. Whatever it is, I want what you want. And our lives turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And it was never again the same. He says, trust and obey. And story after story after story. God just, you know, he just pulled us into this amazing life. I was not in the program to begin with. We had four boys. I was a workaholic at work, and she had to mother something. No, yeah, I wanted did. to adopt a bunch of kids. No, you were. You had a <laughs> goose, you had a goat, you had all kinds of stuff. So anyway, she heard about this kid that was, was a foster kid, and that sounded good to me because that was temporary. And then uh, we had a little girl that was very, very severely damaged, Tam, and we had her for nine months. Uh, we tried to adopt her, and they wouldn't let us that adopt her. That was 1970, her. and in those years, they were not placing special needs children. Mm -hmm. So we thought if we could adopt a child with special needs, we could maybe reverse that. And uh, we heard about Mary Beth, and we went to we stayed in a convent for 10 days <laughs> in separate rooms. We had never <laughs> left our children, ever. And we'd never been separated before. <laughs> <laughs> but they gave us pretty stark uh, news that she wouldn't live to be a teenager, that she would die early in life. 
and she beat all the odds. And, and for a while there, they were offering us kids, and they all pulled through. Everybody was fine, so I, my pride got in there, and I thought well, we could we could handle anything like this. We could bring them through, and we did. And then God showed us. Yeah, God brought them through. Well, I know that, but <laughs> me, <laughs> me thought that. So yeah, and Mary Beth was the light of our life. She pet, she went to heaven, August of two years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You had to trust God. There was no one else to trust in those places. Mary Beth had 80 surgeries by the time she was seven. Yeah. Most of them. Are but I wish you could meet her. She was the feistiest thing. <laughs> An amazing young woman. Uh, and her death was such a surprise. I mean, we were, we were going in for surgery for a uh, some bladder problems she had, and the doctor came down and said she's full of cancer. Mm -hmm. And that was in April, and she died. We took she wanted to come home, and we took her home. And in August, she and I prayed as she left for heaven. God used her to teach us uh, that uh, He's the great healer. He's the miracle worker. He's the one that that does all kinds of things, and they're not like uh, we expect it to be. Where we think of miracles, Jesus did miracles every day, mm -hmm. but we've lived through so many miracles that uh, were such a shock. I mean, it was like I'm not—I don't understand what you're doing, God, but you do all things well. Because I had had experience with special needs children, and we'd been through that discussion, uh, and they called us about this emergency. I called him at work, and it was weird, because there weren't cell phones. You had to go through a series of places to get a hold of somebody. And he said, well, we've been praying our hearts out, and this is the child they offered us. So what do you think? So I said, well, yes. And the preface to that was uh, the little girl had been not well cared for, and she had been born ill and then wound up sicker and sicker. She was placed in this institution. I wrote, uh, um, they called us and said, oh, there's, we'd had her for months and months and months. There's, a, there's an opening. opening, there's an opening. And, and I told her, I said, can't we just keep her? Oh, no, no, we don't place children like her. And we were obedient at that time, and we went down to this hospital training school. And, you know, she was all dressed in pink with a pink knitted blanket and Mary Jane shoes and this precious little girl that we went into the office and uh, we said, just sit, and they took her. And this kind nurse came out and she said, you can come say goodbye. And we walked into this room that was totally white as we passed cribs. There were maybe 45, 50 cribs with babies in them. And some of them were crying and some of them were staring at the ceiling. And I remember one little boy was on his stomach sucking his thumb. And in this white room with white sheets and white nurses laid our baby girl all in pink just listening to figure out where she was at. And we came away devastated. And at the time, I'm a different person now, but at the time, I, I, there's no way, we can't, they won't let us have her. But they did give us visiting rights. And when she died a very few weeks later, we were quiet for a while and then we said, this is what we're supposed to do. We'll, we'll adopt one child with special needs. And right at that same child, right at that same time, we became aware of this agency that plays special needs. And that's how Mary Beth came to us, our fifth and last child. Right. And at the time, I was doing an office in New York City for a doctor who was an obstetrician. I said, Doc, what is spina bifida? And he said, why? I says, uh, we may get this little girl a doctor and she's got spina bifida. I've never heard of it. What is it? He says, don't touch her. I said, I don't understand. What is it? He says, you've got four healthy kids. 
I'll get you all the kids you want. Don't touch that child. I said, well, what is it? He said, I guarantee you'll end up in a divorce. The four kids you have will just torment that child to death. Uh, it'll be terrible. Just trust me. Don't touch that and child. And I had already been to the library. <clears throat> I checked out every book I could find reading about. So anyway, he was at our house. Maybe years two years later, later yeah. Mary Beth and I'd made her a little chair that she could wheel herself around in. And uh, Mary Beth was extremely, extremely intelligent. She spoke in sentences at a year. She knew her colors. She was amazing. Anyway, the doc and I uh, sitting on the couch talking, and Mary Beth came sailing in in her little chair, popped a wheelie, jumped up on the sofa, said, Hi, I'm Mary Beth. Who are you? And he's like, Is this the child? <laughs> Because all he knew is these kids had no life, no no brains, nothing. And uh, I think we made a believer out of him. But. I really felt very inadequate as a mother. All I ever wanted was to be a mother. I, I yearned for babies and children. And I babysat. I, I was a nurse's aide, a candy striper in those years. And um, I just loved babies. But I was scared to death as we were bringing up our, our boys. You know, how do we keep them safe? How do we, you know, God? And Mary Beth came, and God gave me the answer. You give them to me because I'm in charge of them, not you. I'm in charge of your life. I'm in charge of your house. I'm in charge of your husband. I'm in charge of it all, and you can trust me. And that doesn't mean bad things won't happen. It means that everything has its purpose, and in the end, I'll get the glory. glory. Slowly but surely, God brought us through places to direct and prepare us for what he had for us. You know, it says that I'll give you the desires of your heart, but first he puts those desires there. It is desires, then I do. And the, the journey, the adventure, the opportunities, it's just remarkable who our God is. We moved here in 1979. At that point, we had eight children. And uh, my mom had been praying her heart out with all your wheelchairs and what's happening in your life. Life is so much easier in Florida. And at that point, I didn't hear from God. I heard from my mother. And I'm like, Florida's a lovely place to visit, but I couldn't do the heat. I'm not the least bit interested. And it looked so ungrateful, but the story of how we, God gave us this house is nothing short of miraculous. You know, um, mom found this house for someone else we knew who wasn't interested, turned out not interested. And um, the realtor called me and he said, you know, I think that that uh, God wants you to have this. We had been looking at houses. It wasn't like it was a new idea, but we were thinking New Jersey, that's we're gonna find a big house because we were growing out of the house we were in. 
And Ken went to work. It was a Friday. And he told a friend of his, he said, there's no way. We were just economically unable to even think of me flying down there. And this person gave him money. He said, I think God wants you to go. So he took off. He wound up in Atlanta. It was the day before Mother's Day. And he got stuck in Atlanta. So he called me on a payphone and he said, I'm stuck. It looks like I'm not going to get to Gainesville, Florida. And I said, okay, we were obedient. We, we did what, what we felt we were supposed to do. Come on home. And the story from there was he... Crazy. Yeah. We, uh, the realtor picked me up at the airport, took me out here to the house, and we were just being obedient. That, that's all I can say. I would never live in Florida, never in a million years. I had a beautiful career in, in New York City. I worked in New York City. We knew our neurosurgeon's home number. There was a revival we in our had, church. Yep. We had four teenage boys. Everything was in place, and we would never live in Florida. So the realtor says, why won't you live in Florida? I said, well, there's three reasons. He says, well, tell me, what are they? I says, those little gnats, those tsetse flies. Every time we went to her mother's house, I'd get attacked by those things working on the car. He says, there's no gnats here. And there weren't. <laughs> what else? I says, the, the sulfur water. I just cannot take sulfur water. It's terrible. He's right on the aquifer in Interlock, and he says, what's your third excuse? I says, well, I don't know, maybe the heat. He says, well, two out of three isn't bad. So ended up, I gave him a, a check for $100. I said, you need to hold this until I get paid next week. He says, no problem. We had, we had offered one th two-thirds of what they were asking only because that's all we could afford. Well, that's what God put on our yeah, heart right. that we would pay for it. Right. And I forgot where you got that scripture, but yeah. that, was a, that was a number that you got. And he said, that'll be fine. And uh, I went home and I woke her up at 2 o'clock in the morning. He says, well, I bought a house. And she says, what? I said, I bought a house in Florida. So it was, it was still just being obedient all along. And then our church had sponsored, had sponsored uh, what was the name of that agency? People for, from the war, from the Vietnam yeah. War. They were bringing them over. It was World right. Relief is what yeah, it was. World Relief World Services. Relief. And she had had a dream one night of these Asian faces in water just calling out for help. And she says, Ken, we need to, we need to uh, support a family from Laos. And we did. And uh, we got our family from Laos. Uh, they were with us for a year. After we moved here, After the, we moved the, here. the way yeah, we and that was the here. thing, too. The realtor, you know, and it was during a recession. Mm -hmm. We couldn't sell our house. We told the realtor, you know, I guess we're not coming. It's, it's just not working out. We're staying. And he says, come on down. He says, move in the house. He says, we'll close with no money. How's that? And, and that and was And you crazy. wouldn't have to pay any monthly fee. I had kept praying, Lord. Right. We'll walk through open doors. And boom. <laughs> and it, they, became, they became unhinged because I was so reluctant. I just, you know, we've got all these kids. We have all this wonderful, the revival at church and our kids were young people and we had a wonderful Christian school and everything was just the way it should be. And it was constant. It was all the time in Isaiah. It, talk, it talks about... Uh, uh, just trust me, don't fear, I'm with you always, uh, I have your back. We drove down here on October 5th, 1979, with a school bus, that's the other story, but anyway, we wound up packing all our stuff in a school bus, I drove with the kids and puppies and... Litter kittens, I you think. Know, right? and Mom was waiting here. And we drove to the lawyer's office and closed on the house. And even at that point, it was like, what are we doing? Uh, the house was solid, but there was nothing in the kitchen that worked. There was nothing. I, I uh, uh, cooked on a, a fry pan for two and a half years. But it was a, it was a constant walk of faith. Uh, when the family came from Laos... If we had been in New York or New Jersey, we, we would have had all kinds of support. But we were here. We knew no one. We had experiences that were, you know, we talk about miracles. That's kind of where I, I thought there are everyday miracles, children who live through, un, you know, totally without hope surgeries, uh, uh, the house. Uh, the unwelcome, when we came here, 
we were kind of suspicious because we were an odd family and we were also Yankees. Um, and we became involved in a church. We wound up with people bringing us things, people we didn't know. How about your list? I had a, a list of things that I felt this precious family needed. And this woman from Gainesville came. She said, I, I can't do this. My husband wouldn't let me, but my heart is with what you're doing with this family. A husband and wife and three children. He, he had been a, a worked for the United States government on the, the Mekong, Mekong River. River, and he was targeted. And they were living in a, a, a refugee camp in Thailand. And the, they had to get out. They had to get out of the country, and that's how we wound up with them. But, I mean, right down to not, we had no money. He, he didn't even have a job yet down here. And we went to the Gainesville airport and legally parked, and we brought him, them into, you know, uh, a home that was... A shell. <laughs> yeah. And... and the precious lady from World Relief said, look, you don't know what they're living in. And how God used that precious family in our lives. And it just, you were constantly humbled. You were all the time, God, I, I just can't, I can't believe that you're letting us live here. And to see God's love in the lives of these, they came to Christ, they came to church with us. You know, so many places that God worked and, and little by little, he, he, we adopted, we came with adoption that wasn't finalized right. so that the authorities had to monitor us until it was finalized. And when they came to, oh, would you be foster parents? They said, oh, I'm not a foster parent. I, I just can't. There's no way. Well, to make a long story short, we became foster parents. We became medical foster parents. And each time they would come with a child, oh, God, I can't do this. There's no, I, I can't. And again, it was the same thing every single time. Oh, of course you can't, but I can. Hmm. Over and over and over again. I mean, I can remember, uh, I guess it was Charlie. When I was a 14-year-old candy striper, there was a little boy named Billy and he was seven weeks old, and the nurses and the... I always wound up in the children's ward because the other kids didn't want to be there. And here's this baby, and he was starving to death because he was born without a digestive tract. And they just left him in his crib, and I, I would hold him when I was there, and they said, don't bother feeding him because it's no... But it comforted him. And I can remember my heart was broken over this baby. But there was another place where God was teaching me that he's the one that does things well. That baby's in heaven with an end. The verse from, from David when he lost his son, you know, I have the baby. Don't you worry about it. And that's, I guess, Charlie was the first one that we said yes to in that. Yeah. You know, I'll do, okay, we have these kids that were born with spina bifida and they're functional and we're, we're working hard with, with medical things. And then little by little, yes, and then finally it was like, you know, whomever, you send them, hmm. they're ours, over and over and over again. And then God started bringing them home. Uh, Benjamin was the first to go home. And, you know, the Bible says that uh, in Revelation that God doesn't honor you know, the whoremonger and the murderer and the fearful. Sometime in my old past, I read that, that verse, and I thought, of course, fear is the opposite of trust. And we have to trust and obey. And the rest is for up to him. You know... We've, we've gained a, a respect and an appreciation for the fact that we're not home yet. You know, we're just here making sure other people know who Jesus is and wanting them to know that there is an eternal life and God loves them so much. Recently, our youngest became very ill. She was in the uh, intensive care unit for three weeks, two weeks, 
And she's still... It's on a respirator for a week. Yeah. She's still very precarious. But, you know, who is our God? He loves her more than we do. I can remember as I took Mary Beth, the very first little girl, to so many surgeries, and she spoke so well. I'd go in the bathroom and cry, and I'd come out, oh, Lord, don't, don't let her hurt. And she would put her hands on my foot. Oh, Mommy, Mommy, it's okay. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves me. It's okay. And you know what? I, I, if I go to heaven, it's okay. She was three and a half. It's okay. It's better there, right? And as parents, as a mom, I've learned so much from my children. I'm a slow learner, so God gave us a bunch of kids <laughs> to help me learn. <laughs> So I was just wondering if you've been through the hallway where all the pictures of all the children and kids that they've um, fostered and adopted. Um, there's a wall where the ones that have passed away, they've gone on to heaven. But I, I went in there today and I was just crying because it's so beautiful that these would have been just totally forgotten children and they were loved here. They were loved every bit of the time that they were here, and it's just beautiful. So, so each one of these kids has a story. Um, you know, they'll come to us, and I, I'll, I'd be the first one to admit when they come in, I'm terrified. I'm as we step through the process. You know, Lord, I I don't know. And I can remember when they asked us to take, now all of our kids came with special needs and all of them came with um, uncertain futures, but none of us have certain futures. No, we don't. We, do, we don't know what's going to happen to mm -hmm. them. But as they started to ask us to take children that were more, uh, ten, their tendency was, was not to live a long time, you know, uh, yeah, but that's going to hurt. But again, as I said to you before, you know, Jesus made himself vulnerable on a cross, and you can't love, you can't let God love for you, through you, without being blessed. You can't. It's just impossible. All of a sudden, you have to trust him. You can't, there's no other place to turn. And then you see the miracles. You see the miracles. Every time you go in the hospital and you come home, well, you know, there's a place in Psalms that says, uh, I knew you before you were born. I knit you together in your mother's womb. And every day I assign to you are written in a book. So we can't leave this earth one second before or one second after. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's grief, but it's for us. It's not for that. <laughs> uh, we miss them. And even as we're cleaning out that wheelchair shed, floods of memories come by. But then I have to realize that each one, you know, they don't need them anymore. <laughs> Isn't that good news? You know, uh, the longer I live where I live, the longer, the more I want to explain to people, we're all born with a huge handicap. And that's sin. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't show. But without Jesus, there'd be no healing in you. Yeah. You know, so uh, some handicaps you see, some you don't see. But praise God, He's the answer to all of them. I was telling somebody about Elizabeth. Um, here she is. She was 16 months old. We took her home from the hospital. She was just born. She was 16 months old, and she'd wheel herself to the front door, and she'd say, "Hello, did you miss I? You want some coffee?" You know, this is Noah, and this uh, just, we are privileged to live here, but that's only because God took our fear and made us understand that we're not home yet. 
you know, none of us. We, we're looking forward to a home in heaven, and what a reunion. You know, when we were coming home from the hospital, I, I don't know what, well, it was just dramatic to me. We'd been there for two weeks. She was very sick. I wasn't sure whether she was, God was going to let us bring her home. And my husband had called four or five times that morning because they had said, maybe you can go home tomorrow. And I said, I'll text you as soon as the doctors come in and tell, them, tell me whether we can go home. And I, I was in a hurry. There were a lot of people coming and going. And I just texted, coming home. And you're young, so you may not remember all those wonderful songs of, Lord, I'm coming, I'm going home, I'm going home, I'm going home. But then I started thinking, what's the other side looking like? Coming home. When I leave here, I'm coming home. Jesus is looking for me. The loved ones that I've, I've said goodbye to are looking for me. How exciting to think of that perspective. You know, uh, we're on this side, and we've said goodbye, or uh, we'll see you soon to so many. But what about heaven and how we're going to be welcomed home? That's really an exciting thought. You know, we're, we can be overwhelmed by our world, but Jesus said, you're going to have trouble in this world. Expect it. He's not only Redeemer, he's not only Savior, but he's family. And he loves us. And more than anything, he loves our kids. If he cares for the sparrow that falls, he certainly cares for those children. All our children that come to us, every one of them. Yeah. So when we're worried about them, because I, I, oh, Lord, please don't let it hurt anymore. Please, please, somehow, you know, that grace that he gives me, it gives her too. Nobody wants to hurt. That's just, we, we protect ourselves from hurt. And yet, how can God uh, make us into who we need to be? It's only when I'm uncomfortable that I learn lessons. Uh, sadly, that's our, our human, <laughs> you know, we, we get to feeling that we're somewhat self-sufficient. So he puts us in a place where we know better. <laughs> Again, all he wants... In spite of ourselves, all he wants is really our will. And he makes things happen yeah. that are just absolutely not, not there's no explanation for. Um, our house, it had been abandoned for several years. Like she had mentioned, nothing worked in the house. We had buckets. Every time it rained, we'd move a bucket under a dripping ceiling. And, uh, you know, we were just, just, Basically hanging in there. When we bought the house, when we bought, you you intended on fixing it, and then something oh, yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I worked in construction all my life. I was a contractor. I could make anything happen. I had four boys, and we could do whatever we needed, and the roof was no issue. And then in 1982, I was working at a cooling tower in Palak. I fell 26 feet and was out of commission for two years. <laughs> Uh, came home and finally able to hobble around. But during that time, uh, I think we were in the Jacksonville paper. A lady up in Jacksonville had a, a restaurant. She said, I want you folks to come for Christmas dinner. And it was really hard to get everybody and travel that distance then. And we did. We went up there and, and she was just such a blessing. She says, that's a rickety old van you've got. And I said, yeah, it gets us around, but it's it's okay. And she said, I'm going to get you a new van. She says, I'm going to collect money and we're going to buy you a new van. I said, well, that's great. And after probably a year, she said, we got you a van. You got a brand new van. Go pick it up in Jacksonville. The message was, and, isn't it a kind thing to think about? Thank you, Lord, for that kind of encouragement. We yeah. never expected no. it to happen. But we were so thankful that it was just a reminder that God sees everything. Right. So uh, there was a guy, Keith, I don't remember his last name, that came into her restaurant and said, I want to get involved with that van. She said, well, you're a little late. They've got their van. He said, oh, man, what can we do? She said, well, they need a roof. He said, okay, we'll put a roof on your house. 
She says, okay, here's their number. And he called me, spoke to Laverne. He says, I am Keith from the Church of God in Jacksonville. We want to put a roof on your house. And she laughed at him. She says, you know, it's a big roof. You better says, come and look it's at a the house. house. Isn't it? He says, yeah, but no problem. So she says, well, you better come. So he came and he looked at our house. It's 135 squares. And he says, wow, that is a big house. He says, could you folks come to our church on Sunday? Bring the family. We did. And it was a small congregation. There were not that many people in that church. And uh, they, they introduced us to the congregation. And I think the next week he called. He says, well, we'll be there Wednesday with material. We'll put a roof on your house. And that very act changed the entire did. experience. We could then take in kids from the state. Prior to that, the house was in such disrepair that it wasn't possible. But now we had a safe structure. And just like all the, we've got three heat pumps now, we're, we're just blessed beyond beyond our means. Uh, over and over, over and, and over, over and over again. again. Needs are met. Yeah. Needs are met. Needs are met. And he just continues to pull the plug on everything. It's all he wants is your will. You get out of the way. You and a view of understanding do. that whatever's here is only temporary. Right. Second Corinthians 4 talks about what Paul was going through. He said, you know, I'm going through all these places, but it's okay because I'm not living for what you can hold in your hand. I'm living for eternal things. They last forever. And and it's, I said, I'm a slow learner, but over and over and over again, and as God has brought our kids home, that's your only alternative. You, you're, you're put in positions where, you know, Lord, I have to trust you. Right. You know. Um, and like she said, we travel to Shands a lot. And I remember all the time we see these kids with the masks and they had cancer. And I said, wow, that's terrible. These poor <laughs> kids. That's something I couldn't handle. I could not handle a terminally ill child. And uh, we've had kids die in our arms. Um, and, and, it's, and ironically, um, we never had a child with cancer until our very first yeah. adoption two years ago. She was, she was 49. She was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, it was just, you know, here's, this is the child that God brought the vision with. And it, it was much harder than many of the other places we went until again you yield to God's will and you see the goodness of it Mary Beth when she was offered uh, treatment and she had told me that you know she had said mom if it ever comes to the point where uh, they're just saving uh, breaths in my life and I'm not functional anymore if God wants to heal me, he'll heal me. But the prognosis was, it was everywhere. Yeah. It was all over. So she made, she, she made the decision. She said, I, I don't, and I want to go home to my house. She had an apartment just up the, and I stayed with her those last weeks. And her brothers flew home from all over the place. And it was, this young woman taught us all. You know, Clarice came home from Pennsylvania. And then you realize the value of one. <laughs> you know, I hesitate when people say how many, because he cares about each one as if they were the only one. So, and one, one thing that I, uh, I think both of us would say in this recent hospitalization, again, when I drove out the driveway with her, I thought, oh, Lord, I don't know that I can do this. I'm so exhausted. You know, I was 30-some and then 40-some and then 50-some. and But I'm just, I know what it's like living at that hospital. And I, I, I don't remember things. And I'm going to be with uh, doctors and nurses that need answers. So I really need you. And I didn't know it, but at least two other people came to me after it was all over and said to me, I was praying for clarity for you. 
And as I left that hospital, I came home to Ken and I said, I can't believe it. I remembered the names of medicines and, and history of 17 years. Uh, it was, and that was a miracle. <laughs> that really was. The other thing I think Ken would agree is God has sent so many wonderful people into our life. Boy, I know. You know, it isn't... And just our church, with what they're doing right, here now, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. It really is. Uh, Every chapel could have been... Doctors and nurses and, and just people that have come to encourage uh, uh, supplies showing up miraculously <laughs> we are all in this together and there have been contributions from many 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 people in order to have us live the lives we you know you don't do it alone god knows the need and he fills it many times with a lot of people prayers that's what we covet yeah. i want to the verses in Job, you know, he went through all those places. And it says that in the end, God used him more than in the beginning. That's and that's my prayer. And we covet prayers because I want to keep standing until the very end. So God gets the glory. God puts the love there. God puts the strength there. God puts the fun and laughter and wonderful times, the parades with the kids at birthdays and the, uh, you know, we, we definitely in those places where we're well enough to, to express our heart, we're very thankful to live where we live. And it's amazing how he made us who we are because where I lack he gains where he, it's just kind of like knit together. And it's, I, I didn't realize it. We're married 61. It'll be 62 years this year. And you go through those places where you, you know, he just plain doesn't understand and vice versa. But isn't that what he does? He, he knits you together and he, God doesn't make mistakes. He does all things well. He does. <laughs> You know, I, the, the kids just gave me a surprise 80th birthday, <laughs> which was, you don't surprise me, ask my family. I always know the end of a mystery. I always, but we were going through so many places recently that I didn't catch the hints. And they surprised me completely. And I looked around at each of those kids and the sacrifices that they made to be in this family. Every one of our boys, except one, has adopted many children. So, praise God, they saw the vision. Mm. And you pray that for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. The most important thing is that they follow Jesus and know him and be who God made them to be. Whoever that may be, God has a purpose for each one of us. And one purpose is no greater than another. Just follow after him hard and love him and tell people about Jesus.
body of Christ that you've won us into. Lord, we thank you for the increase of our ability this weekend and in all we can. Good. Looking good.